Father, which art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name, name thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Good morning, honorable members. When the business of the House suspended on the 18th of October, the member for Marco City had reserved the floor. We are at second reading of bills. But before we proceed, um, I have acceded to the request for the honorable member for North Andrus and the Berry Islands who wish to make a brief statement. The Chair recognizes the Honorable Member for North Andrus and the Berry Islands. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So, Speaker, this morning I would like to recognize one of my great constituents out of the North Andrus and Berry Islands constituency, one of whom I can brag and say is from North. Mastic Point, where I reside in Bourne. Hmm. Um, she is none other than Miss Daniela Danielle Gator, who was presently in the Miss Universe part uh, universe uh, Miss Farmers Universe, mm -hmm. where she was placed third in the overall competition. And today she is in the midst studying to be the first new neurologist female neurologist in this country. I would like to commend her for the work that she has done so far and is continuing to, to do as a young lady in the community of North Andrus. And I wish her all the best, Ms. Daniel Gator. Thank you, Honorable Member. Uh, Honorable Members, I wish to uh, deal with a matter and to give a ruling on uh, <coughs> a motion 
by the Honorable Member for Cat Island Rumkey and San Salvador with respect to parliamentary privilege. On the 18th of October, I received a statement from the Honorable Member for Cat Island Rumkey and San Salvador, the interim leader of the Progressive Liberal Party, as he then was, and the leader of Her Majesty's loyal opposition. Now, the officially elected leader of the PLP. The statement raised a matter of privilege arising out of a newspaper report published in the Tribune dated the 11th of October 2017 on matters relating to a statement made by the Honorable Member for East Grand Bahama under the headline, PLP devoted 40 million to buy last election. The statement was read into the records of the House. In the statement, the Honorable Member adopted and quoted a statement attributed to the Member for East Grand Bahama and raised concerns regarding what he considered untrue and injurious and requested that this matter be investigated by the Committee on Privileges. The statement that aggrieved the Honorable Member for Cat Island, Rumpke, and San Salvador was quoted as, as follows. And even now, more bills continue to trickle in. The PLP government, we suspect, obtained a resolution to borrow $150 million on hurricane relief, but instead diverted $40 million plus of that sum for unauthorized expenditure on any number of things in an ultimately vain effort to buy the election win. And while that money most likely went to their cronies and other wasteful spending, it is the Bahamian people who are stuck with the bill. With respect to the statement from the Honorable Member for Cat Island, Rumkey, and San Salvador, the discovered grounds of the member's complaint are, firstly, the Honorable Member for East Grand Bahama remarks are untrue, and secondly, that the Honorable Member for East Grand Bahama imputed improper motives against him, the member for Angliston, and against the PLP as a whole, which can be construed as criminal acts. Further, the Honorable Member for Cat Island, Rumkey, and San Salvador stated in his statement, let me say that this Member of Parliament was not a party to any untoward scheme or any scheme at all to divert or appropriate sums of money that were allocated for and towards the expenses of the Commonwealth of the Bahamas. In the same story referred to by the Member for Cat Island, Rumkey, and San Salvador, on page six of the Tribune, the member for East Grand Bahama is quoted as stating to suggest that I stated in Parliament last week that the money was stolen, misappropriated, or went missing is deceitful and entirely misleading. I have carefully examined the statements of the honorable member for East Grand Bahama in relation to the complaint together with the interpretation and response of the member for Cat Island, Rumkey, and San Salvador. And I am not satisfied that the criteria have been as satisfied to order or to establish a prima facie case of privilege. Normally, in these circumstances, the speaker is not obliged to give reasons for such a finding. But the Speaker does have authority to make a statement and, uh, and to the House if the Speaker considers that circumstances warrant one. In all circumstances, and because of the widespread interest in this matter, together with the fact that a number of criminal proceedings relating to matters of, previous government, of the previous government's expenditure remain extant, this is an issue in which I have decided to explain the basis for my decision to the House so as to minimize speculations and not prejudice those hearings or interfere in any material way with matters that are before the court. 
I have found that the facts and evidence provided are insufficient to ostensibly establish a fact or a case unless disproved. No question of privilege is established. Perhaps had the member for East Grand Bahama made his statement in Parliament, it may have uh, certainly caused or provoked a point of order. But there is no breach of privilege made out pursuant to the provisions of Rule 3317, which deals with imputations of improper motives and personal reflections on the member. Rule 3318, which deals with offensive, abusive, or insulting words. And or Rule 3319, which deals with objectionable words. Nor is there any breach of privilege under the provisions of Rule 37, which deals with privilege. If we look at the classic definition of parliamentary privilege, which is found in Erskine May, Parliamentary Practice, uh, the 22nd edition on page 65. According to Erskine May, the privilege of parliament are rights which are absolutely necessary for the due execution of its powers. They are enjoyed by individual members because the House cannot perform its function without unimpeded use of the services of its members and by each house for the protection of its members and the vindication of its own authority and dignity. Privilege essentially belongs to the house as a whole. Individual members can only claim privilege insofar as any denial of their rights or threat made to them would impede the functioning of the house. In addition, Individual members cannot claim privilege or immunity on matters that are unrelated to their functions in the House. The Leader of the Opposition did not allege that the statement or any part thereof made by the member for East Grand Bahama as published in the Tribune report falls specifically within or foul of the rules and or principles enunciated above. The standard of proof demanded by in establishing a prima facie case of privilege is the civil standard of proof on a balance of probabilities. But given the serious nature of the allegations, proof of a very high order is required. The need for such high measure of proof is underscored by the fact that there is effectively no right of appeal. Even if the member for East Grand Bahama was loose negligent or reckless, and I'm not saying that he was, in the use of words, this in itself falls short of the standard required to hold a member responsible for deliberately misleading the public or the House for that matter. Honorable members, for a misleading of the House to be deliberate, there must be something in the nature of an incorrect statement that indicates the intention to mislead. There must be such much more than just hurt feelings as a result of a statement or the anxiety of fleeing when no one chasing. It is against this background that I rule that the matter referred to me do not constitute a prima facie case for breach of privileges, and to rule otherwise would result, in my estimation, in the ancient privilege that I pledge to protect being modified or surrendered. And I do so rule. The chair recognizes the honorable member for Marco City. 
very much, Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Speaker. At this time, I'd like to yield my time to the member for Marathon, the Minister of the Environment. The Chair recognizes the Honorable Member for Marathon. Morning, Mr. Speaker, <clears throat> and members of this Honorable House. Before I begin, Mr. Speaker, I would like to extend sincere and heartfelt condolences to the family of Calvin Johnson, who recently passed away, a member of our great party, a man who dedicated his life to the service of our nation. Mr. Speaker, I would also wish to congratulate the Honorable Member from Cat Island, Rumkey, and San Salvador on his preferment to his high office. I would also wish to extend my congratulations as leader of Her Majesty's Royal Opposition. I would also wish to extend my congratulations to the member from Exuma and Ragged Island who has attained the lofty status of deputy leader, and extend my congratulations to South Andrus, South and Central Andrus, on leader of opposition business in the House, a man I've known a long time, uh, from the University of the West Indies days, <laughs> a, man who, a man who undoubtedly will fire things up. And last but not least, I'd like to congratulate the member from Engliston on her newfound freedom. <laughs> uh, she has, the, the, mem the, mem the member for Engliston has always been unbridled, and I would imagine even the more so in this new role. But congratulations to all of them. I wish them well in their offices. Mr. Speaker, I rise to offer my comments and to make my contribution in this debate on the establishment of an independent director of public prosecutions. Before I proceed any further, Mr. Speaker, I would like to thank the good constituents of Marathon for allowing me to be here in this honorable house to speak on their behalf and to represent their interests. Marathon has always had a legacy of commitment to fostering and strengthening our democracy. And I wish to assure the residents of our great constituency that that tradition will flourish under my watch. Today, Mr. Speaker, the 1st of November 2017 is a very special day for four of my constituents, Mr. Speaker, as they celebrate their birthdays today. And because we in Marathon have always had a rich legacy of celebrating each other's milestones, I would be remiss in my duty if I did not extend warm birthday greetings to Charles Fernanda, Lakeisha Louis, Henry Marias, and David Rowe. May they continue to be showered in the blessings of Almighty God. Mr. Speaker, our party, the FNM party, has always distinguished itself from the side opposite by demonstrating a willingness to tackle the tough issues. Whether it was freeing the airwaves or building infrastructure in our family islands and New Providence or liberalizing our economy or bolstering the social safety net in our attempt to wipe every tear from every eye. The Bahamian people have always looked to us to solve the big issues and to go long, as my colleague from Elizabeth mentioned in his contribution. Mr. Speaker, I wish to say for the avoidance of any doubt that introducing legislation to establish an independent director of public prosecutions falls squarely within this ambit. Perhaps it's because so many of us have experienced unrelenting and vicious victimization 
at the hands of the PLP that we are sensitive to institutionalizes abuses of power, which suffocate access to justice and makes a mockery of decency and social order by providing yellow and gold colored get out of jail free cards without remorse. Mr. Speaker, the idea of having an independent director of public prosecutions is not a new one. As some of my colleagues have waxed so eloquently before I rose to make my contribution and my comments to this debate, several jurisdictions around the world, indeed in this region, have enshrined such legislation. In fact, the concept is also not new in the Bahamas. The idea haven't been floated around for some time. Mr. Speaker, lest we forget, what brought this issue to a head was the blatant abuse, misuse, and bastardization of the judicial system by the previous administration through the indiscriminate use, misuse, and abuse of the system of entering a nolly prosecution. Mr. Speaker, no reasonable person can deny that the entering of nollies are an essential element of our judicial system. But, Mr. Speaker, ultimately, the Bahamian people grew tired of the Attorney General's office providing get-out-of-jail-free cards to former clients, friends, family, and lovers. This is against a backdrop where the victims of their crimes are denied justice or their loved ones are going to jail simply because they're not former clients. Mr. Speaker, all this legislation seeks to do is to remove the prosecutorial discretion out of the hands of the Office of the Attorney General and vest it into an independent director of public prosecutions. Mr. Speaker, seldom do we see governments seeking to divest themselves of power. But essentially, that is what this transformational government is doing. We are establishing an independent director of public prosecutions in order to not create a fiefdom or to vest such power in the hands of a civil servant who is not answerable to the people through the parliamentary process we are setting out clear circumstances if, when necessary, the Director of Prosecutions is directed by the Office of the Attorney General. Thus, Mr. Speaker, after the passage of this bill, the Director of Public Prosecutions can only be directed by the Attorney General with clear reasons. And Mr. Speaker, we are going even further in introducing an amendment to this bill where those reasons must be gazetted, thereby ensuring that they stand up to public scrutiny. This is empowering the people, Mr. Speaker. This is strengthening, strengthening the participatory governance that we all enjoy. Mr. Speaker, this is the people's time. Mr. Speaker, the Bahamians deserve, the Bahamian people deserve no less than to be provided with the information, all of the information, that so dramatically impacts their lives, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, in the run-up to the last election, and indeed on the campaign trail, we went throughout the length and breadth of this great country, promising that if elected, we would establish an independent Director of Public Prosecutions. Mr. Speaker, this was a message that resonated with the Bahamian people, a message whose reverberations resulted in the largest political landslide win in the history of Bahamian politics. Mr. Speaker, I have said before in this Honorable House on another occasion that love is a verb. By introducing this piece of legislation, we are definitely taking action. More importantly, Mr. Speaker, we're showing love to all Bahamians now and in the future. And permit me to explain, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, if, God forbid, 
our country is ever again run by a political party who would be willing to allow the political ambitions of a few men to dash the political aspirations of a whole people. If this nation is ever again misled by the PLP described by one of their very own as a party overcome with envy, consumed with jealousy, and stung by greed, at least it would be that much more difficult to manipulate the strings of justice with arrogance and impunity. They would have to gazette their reasons, Mr. Speaker, and do something which makes them very uncomfortable. Engage and answer to the Bahamian public, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I have dedicated my entire life to serving my country, to bring in law and environment together. I remember one time being advised by my priest at the time, no offense to you, Father Bartlett, but this was Father James Mutri on that occasion, and he explained to me that law and environment was really God and creation. He said, God, Almighty God, is reflected in the law and creation in the environment. And it was under this covering, and it was this covering, that gave me the courage to speak out against the environmental injustices committed by the former government. For their abuses, to speak out against a government that became dishonest and had lost touch with too many people. Whether it was standing up for justice in the wake of the Marathon oil spill cover-up, or speaking out on behalf of the residents of Bimney, even leading judicial action to prevent the environmental destruction of their island by overdevelopment. Mr. Speaker, as a result of standing up for what I believed in, for having the courage to face my own convictions placed in my heart, by the Almighty, speaking out on behalf of those who had no voices or whose voices were stemmed by fear. As a result of that, Mr. Speaker, I experienced brutal victimization. I endured threats of death, attempted break-ins at my home and my office, car tires slashed, harassment of my dear mother, on her deathbed. Some of my colleagues, Mr. Speaker, endured much more than this. Mr. Speaker, these criminal acts were reported, but no prosecutorial action was taken. Ultimately, Mr. Speaker, to ensure my safety and that of my family, we had to reach out to an international human rights body for help, who urged the then government to ensure our safety and those of our colleagues. So for me, Mr. Speaker, I have a special interest in this piece of legislation. Anything which strengthens the independence and the independence of the prosecutorial system in this country will get my support. Mr. Speaker, I know it is like to lose a loved one and to not have your day in court. I experienced that with the passing of my sister, Jean Pateman. Much the same way persons who have lost loved ones are denied their day in court through the abusive use, as I outlined before, of the Nolly system. Mr. Speaker, the good people of Marathon put me here to represent their interests in matters of state. I solicited their views, their views, and canvassed their opinions, Mr. Speaker, and they overwhelmingly support this bill, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, it is then with great pleasure I say and declare in this honorable house today that Marathon supports this bill.
In closing, Mr. Speaker, I would wish to assure the Bahamian public that, is the, that it is our intention, and we have always done so, to lead from our needs. Thank you for that. It's a great reminder. No hair grows on our knees, Mr. Speaker, because we're always on them. <laughs> <laughs> but in closing, Mr. Speaker, I wish to thank the wonderful people of Marathon who believed in me, who believed in the possibility of change, who were tired of being governed by a party which had become consumed and overcome with envy and jealousy and stung by greed. To those constituents of Marathon, I express my unfeigned gratitude. And to you I say, you are that gentle rain which falls from heaven and nourishes and strengthens me with droplets of life. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As many. The Chair recognizes the Honorable Member for Southern Shores. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'm once again privileged and humbled to rise in this honorable place on behalf of the good people of Southern Shores who have given me this opportunity, an opportunity that I will continue to cherish for as long as I'm here. Mr. Speaker, I want to join the Honorable Member for Marathon and all others who wish to offer condolences to the family of our colleague in the Free National Movement and a former member of Parliament in this very honorable place, uh, Mr. Calvin Johnson. Um, I pray that God will give them the strength to accept his will and to carry on. And um, I might note that the post mistress of the general post office is also a relative of his and I wish to personally offer my condolences to her. And while I'm on the topic of condolences, I would like to offer condolences to the family of Beryl, to Beryl Lloyd and family. That's a family residing in Marshall Road on the passing of her mother. I pray too that God would strengthen them as they grieve. Mr. Speaker, I would like to congratulate the basketball team of the Anatole Rogers uh, High School, which also is in Southern Shores. I'm reliably informed that on the weekend pass, they went to Abaco, where they performed extremely well I won't brag, but I have reasons to brag. <laughs> and, and to show you how careful I am, to show you how careful I am, North Abaco, I'm going to ask them when they go to these family islands to temper themselves because as the minister for local government, I have to travel to these islands and I want to get some kind of reception. So Anatole Eagles, as you do what you do, temper yourselves and make room for me to be able to visit. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Speaker, as the Minister for Local Government, I had the privilege to pay an official visit to Grand Bahama on Thursday and Friday past. And the purpose of that visit was to meet with all the departments within the ministry, all five of them, and ap accepting the fact that no good man travels alone, I took with me all of my heads of department, and we were able to sit with the road traffic department, the port department, the Met Office, the post office, and we were able to hear their concerns, and we were able to speak to the government's position. We were able to indicate where answers were not available at the time that answers will be forthcoming. 
I, I was humbled by the fact that they really appreciated the visit. They appreciated the fact that there is a change in the air. This whole attitude of a Nassau-centric government um, seemed to be changing, where central government is leaving the offices of New Providence and going to sit with the actual practitioners to hear their cry and to commiserate with them. And I thank God, Mr. Speaker, I believe this has much to do with the fact that early in my life, in my other career, I would have had the opportunity to be stationed in a remote family island or the remote part of a family island. I can't call Exuma a remote family island. But Rollville would have been considered a remote part of that island being 26 miles from Georgetown. And to feel, to feel the neglect of central government or to feel the neglect of police headquarters not responding quickly to the needs of that area. And I want to put Abaco on notice that notwithstanding what happened with Anatole Rogers, yes, I'm en route to Abaco tomorrow, and we're going to have that same kind of, of discussion, and we're going to nurture this relationship that I'm satisfied will result in benefits for Bahamians everywhere. Mr. Speaker, to my good people in the General Post Office, I would be remiss if I didn't take this opportunity to express my gratitude for the patience that they continue to exercise, the diligence they continue to show to duty. I've had a meeting with the union that represent them and we are in discussions on the way forward. There is hope, there is light at the end of the tunnel, but I just want to thank them for continuing to do what it is they do and to let them know that their plight has not been forgotten. They continue to be on the front burners of the activities within our ministry. Mr. Speaker, my colleagues who spoke before me said all, in my humble opinion, that needs to be said about the bill that is before us. And while scheduling conflicts have not allowed for me to have a town hall meeting in Southern Shores specifically on this matter, I did have the opportunity to canvas pockets of constituents, and I'm confident to stand here to say that Southern Shores supports this bill. Mr. Speaker, on the question of a town hall meeting, I would put Southern Shores on notice that our next town hall meeting would be on Thursday the 9th of this month at Anatole Rogers. Stay tuned for more notices. Mr. Speaker, for more than 18 months prior to May 10th, 2017, the Honorable Member for Kalani canvassed the entire archipelago of the Bahamas, expressing his desire to become the leader. And during that 18 months or more, the Honorable Member made it no secret yes. that should he be successful, and thank God he is, that he will cause to be introduced an independent director of public prosecution. Yes. Politicians are known far and wide for being very promising fellows. <laughs> talk, good talk. They promise 
and then they forget. I'm happy to be a part of a team that is seeking to deliver on promises made. But what I find interesting, most interesting, Mr. Speaker, is during those 18 months, there were some persons who had the reins, who had all and every opportunity to say, you know what, that ain't a bad idea. And since it might benefit the Bahamian people, let us do it. But they didn't, Mr. Speaker. They didn't. They were busy carrying out their own agenda. And I respect that. It was their time. I humbly say, now it's the people's time. <laughs> And so for and on behalf of the people, we have come delivering on a promise that we know will benefit the people. But, but, but what I find somewhat disheartening, Mr. Speaker, the people who had the opportunity to do this now have all the best ideas on how it should be done. Where they been, Mr. Speaker, for five years? I hear the cries that it ain't independent enough because someone could tell them what to do. And Mr. Speaker, if I'm not mistaken, no one questions the independence of Her Excellency Governor General However, even Her Excellency, Governor General, is subject to the opinion or advice of somebody else in the person of the Honorable Prime Minister who may seek leave of Her Majesty to replace Her Excellency. Does that mean Her Excellency is not independent? I, I, I'm disappointed in those who had the opportunity, chose not to seize the opportunity, and then would come and try to, 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 to cause persons who might not be of that legal understanding to believe that something untoward is afoot. Mr. Speaker, the simple facts of the matter is that where there was once. The Chair recognizes the Honorable Member for Cat Island, Rumpkins, and Salvador on a point of order. Um, I, I contributed to this bill, and whereas the member has not sig sig signaled out who he attributes the impression he got that someone was saying that something is untoward this bill, let me categorically say that that is an incorrect understanding of what I may have said to this House in respect to this bill. What I said to this bill, that this is doing nothing more than, than codifying what presently exists, and that, and that by virtue of clause uh, clause clause 78 Subclause three, subclause three, there's, it, it, it is not making, there's no such thing as an independent, an in, independent, independent, independent uh, director of public prosecutions. And all I'm saying, and all our position was, is speak, tell the Bahamian people what you are actually doing. You're doing nothing new. You're not, in our view, creating an an independent um, director of public prosecutions. That's, that's our position. That's what I said. Thank you, Honorable, and honorable saying, Member. He, I, and, he, and for him to say... Uh, honorable Members, I, ac I accept the Honorable Member for Cat Island, Ramkey, and San Salvador clarification on a matter that was raised in his contribution. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, I realize that in my opening, I, I, 
I realized in my opening that I didn't congratulate the <laughs> honorable member. And as, as we have been known in, 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 in here, referred to each other as, uh, as uh, buddies. Yes, ginger ale buddies. Uh, Mr. <laughs> Speaker, I, I, I want to, no, no, no fun, no, no fun. I want to congratulate the, the member for achieving something that I know would have been his heart desire for some time. And um, I believe he's going to do well. <laughs> I, I, I want to, I want to congratulate, I want to congratulate Exuma. Um, fresh, new blood is what this country needs. And so, as you ascend, I, 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 I want to, I want to, if I might, both you and I are new here, but if I may admonish you to keep your eye on the objective, keep your eye on the people, and don't allow yourself to be sidetracked necessarily by the status quo and I say that with every sincerity. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you know, Mr. Leader, as human beings, our imperfection um, causes us to make some mistakes, and we are all allowed one. <laughs> <laughs> and Mr. Speaker, my, my good friend, my good friend, long-time friend, we sit on the wall together in McCullough Corner, you know. We talk about... Uh, Church of God, Lily of the Valley. And so I'm pleased, I'm pleased to congratulate him also. And Mr. Speaker, for my, my, my parishioner, who's concerned that I get enough time, she wants me to have more than five minutes. <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, I say to you, your services will not go unnoticed, and you and I will always be from the cathedral in the east, in the pond, St. Matthew. Mr. Speaker, the honorable member stood on a point of order which suggested initially that I might have been out of order. But Mr. Speaker, I don't consider myself to be out of order by suggesting that a group of persons, because I, I, I would not seek to single out any individual opposite. But all the individuals opposite would have to accept that as a group, they were in a position to cause something to happen. And since that thing didn't happen, it is only them who could be blamed for not causing it to happen. Yeah. Now, if I'm out of order for saying that, Mrs. Speaker, <laughs> I'll take my legs for being out of order. Mrs. Speaker, this government of the people is seeking to deliver to the people that which it promised. There are some people who will be uncomfortable when they see and hear of promises being delivered because they're used to that. Well, get used to it. Because as we are here, we will be delivering on many, many, many more promises. Mr. Speaker, you can see and feel the change around here. Walk in here one minute after 10, and you can't get in. The door is closed. There was a time when 11, 11, 30, we're still waiting for this operation to start. Change is here, and I advise all who are uncomfortable with this change to get used to it, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, I've spoken about the, the independence, and there will always be, based on who is speaking, whether it's independent or not. But you know what is undeniable, Mr. Speaker? The veil of darkness that once covered this process is going to be removed as a result of this bill. You know, when people could, could throw rock and then hide their hand and say, Amy, 
that ain't gonna be able to happen on the passing of this bill. Because anyone who is bold enough while sitting as the Attorney General to interfere with this independent Director of Public Prosecution will have to account to the people. And as my colleague would have indicated earlier, this accounting wouldn't come after questioning. This accounting will come up front. You interfere, you say, Mr. Director of Public Pros Independent Prosecutor, don't do this or do that. And before anyone asks you a question, you put that in writing and you gazette it for all and sundry to see. That is the major fundamental difference that is going to come as a result of this bill. Mr. Speaker, for 29 years I served as a police officer. And in those 29 years, there are stories upon stories upon stories of persons not necessarily feeling that they will get fair treatment, about persons being concerned that their name is not so-and-so, so-and-so, or so-and-so, so they're likely to be overlooked. Because they weren't necessarily politically connected, their matters would be put on the back burner. This government, Mr. Speaker, the People's Government, has sought to remove as much as possible the likelihood of the political interference that will result in cases that we've seen recently, where questions are being asked of a sitting member, and because his very own colleagues who are responsible for making the decisions, persons in the community have very little faith that anything would be done. I was a policeman, Mr. Speaker. When my police officer colleagues made a certain recommendation, but that recommendation had to go to the AG's office. The AG had to make the final determination against a colleague of the AG. And mind you, Mr. Speaker, it could have been, it could have been that the AG made the right decision. It could have been. But owing to the fact that the AG and the person concerned had such close connectivity, there would always be that doubt. And it is that doubt, Mr. Speaker, that this bill is seeking to remove. This doubt will benefit both the person who is suspected and the person who is making the complaint. And having some level of satisfaction, Mr. Speaker, that the person who is making the decision has the ability and the opportunity. You see, some people have the ability to do some things, but they're not necessarily given the opportunity. Mr. Speaker, this independent director will have not only the ability, but they will have the opportunity provided them by law that they can act according to what says the law? They can act according to their conscience, knowing that they won't be interfered with lightly. And if they are interfered with, the blame will not be left on them. The person who did the interfering will have to explain to the entire Bahamas why the interference took place. So in that regard, Mr. Speaker, I support this bill. I'm satisfied that this bill will help to advance the judiciary in the Bahamas. I'm satisfied that this bill will level the playing field. 
that the young man in Bain and Grant's town can now feel that the same attention given to Lyford Key, Port New Providence, is likely to be given to him. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, fair play is what this country needs. The Free National Movement came to government promising fair play, promising to level the playing field. Our leader came to office promising to fight corruption in high places because we strongly believe that among the other things that contribute to crime is the fact that persons sit in their lowly status and they see persons in their high status being able to do things and get away with it. Imagine the young man in Bain Town saying, if it's all right for Lyford Key with the stroke of a pen to get away with embezzling half a million, what's wrong with me borrowing $50? <laughs> but Mr. Speaker, but Mr. Speaker, but Mr. Speaker, I choose not to use colors. <laughs> But Mr. Crime. Speaker, a crime. crime is a crime, <laughs> notwithstanding the color. But Mr. Speaker, I want to assure you, without fear of honest contradiction, when the little fella in Centerville sees a fella from Lightfoot Key doing the bank clean shuffle, he's inclined to believe, boy, if they could do that to him, I better be careful. And that is the message that all of us in this honorable place ought to want to be sending to the Bahamas. That what is good for the goose is good for the gander. That wrong is wrong even if it's done by our best friends. And right is right even if it's done by our worst enemies. Mr. Speaker, Southern Shores supports this bill. I rest. As many, the chair recognizes the honorable member for North Abaco. Mr. Speaker, in the interest of civility, which should always be on this place, I too wish to add my voice of approbation to the leader of the opposition duly elected, to his deputy leader, a man in whom we all have tremendous confidence and great faith who will seek to change things as they are on that side. Or just change, right? <laughs> and to the new leader of opposition business in this house, an island boy like myself who has finally risen to a place of prominence in his party despite being elected I think three consecutive times. This side is distinctly different. First time as like me, I Prime Minister puts in the cabinet. Oh. Trans transformation. I, I would also wish to commend the former leader of opposition business in the House who fought a good fight. And to say that I was actually, I was actually in her corner. But I say to you, but I say to you, Angliston, get not weary and well doing. Because in due season, listen to me now, I'm preaching to you. <laughs> you shall reap if you faint not. Mr. Speaker, the report of the Constitutional Commission into a review of the Bahamas Constitution debated dated July 2013 in its executive summary highlighted four areas that were deemed urgent for reform in this country. These included the amendment of the citizenship provisions to achieve gender neutrality and full equality between men and women with respect to the acquisition or transmission of their nationality, 
the expansion of the definition of discrimination in Article 26 to include sex as a prohibited ground, and more importantly to what we debate today, the creation of a constitutionally and operationally autonomous director of public prosecutions with control over public prosecutions. And fourthly, the creation of an independent and constitutionally secure election boundaries commission with responsibility for the conduct elections and reviewing the boundaries of constituencies. And so, Mr. Speaker, as the assistant to Mr. Lauren Klein, who served as the technical officer of that well-regarded commission, which was chaired by Mr. Sean McQuinney, QC, it gives me tremendous, a tremendous sense of achievement to stand in this place today on behalf of the great constituency of North Abaco to endorse this Constitution Amendment Bill 2017, which will establish the Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions, DPP, and for all intents and purposes, cause the hold of that office to act independently of the Attorney General where legal criminal proceedings for and against the state are taken in the name of the independent DPP. But before I add my two cents to the bill, Mr. Speaker, I crave your indulgence to extend heartfelt condolences to the families of Michael Nairn of Cooperstown, who will lay to rest his son, Michael Jr., on this coming Saturday, and to the families of Hartley Boodle and Ernestine Parker of Treasure Key, who tragically lost their daughter, Hadiria Boodle, a young mother of three small children, to what appears to have been a senseless murder. I also, Mr. Speaker, would like to extend profound condolences to the family of Calvin Johnson, whose brother is a constituent. I wish also to say to my constituents that I intend to come home on tomorrow, where I will hold town meetings at Little Abaco on tomorrow evening, Green Hill Key on Friday evening, and hopefully Grand Key on Sunday evening. The exact times and venues for the meetings will be forthcoming as soon as possible. I wish also to remind constituents that our constituency office remains open from 9 to 5 on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, where Ms. John Lewis is doing a stellar job in recording and conveying concerns to your member of parliament. Mr. Speaker, also permit me, in my capacity as the Foreign Minister of the Bahamas, to extend to the government and peoples of the United States of America our heartfelt condolences owing to the loss of life due apparently to a another senseless attack by domestic terrorists in New York yesterday. The Bahamas continues to condemn cowardly acts of terror and to note that the use of violence to achieve political ends will never work. It will only beget more violence. Our thoughts and prayers are with the families of those impacted by this hideous event. A formal note conveying our regrets and heartfelt sentiments has been sent to the government and people of the United States. Mr. Speaker, it would be remiss of me if I didn't thank the people of North Abaco for according me this opportunity to stand as their representative in this place. Mr. Speaker, North Abaco approves this piece of legislation, not because it's perfect, no law is perfect, but because it builds on this Prime Minister and his government's transformational agenda toward removing the prevailing stigma of endemic corruption from our country. I don't know why, I don't know why they're interfering with you, Prime Minister. <laughs> No, 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 we ain't gonna let you dance with him. Give <laughs> <laughs> some water, please, Michael. Give some water, please. 
You know, Prime Minister, I thought, you know, I'm not going to get in that, right? But you know, you know, Prime Minister, I thought that was a lovely photograph. <laughs> I thought it was a fine example. <laughs> I thought it was a fine example of a leader who's showing and demonstrating to us in the country how one should, how one should affectionately dance with his loving wife of many, many years. <laughs> <laughs> Quite frankly, I think you ought to be commended, not chided. You know, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I, I ain't going there. No, no, no. I, I, can deal, I want to deal with this bill. I want to deal with this bill, right? The point I wish to make is that this bill is a part of our transformational agenda to remove the prevailing stigma of endemic corruption from our country. You know, one wise person once said that perception is reality. Or put another way, life is how you perceive reality. But my perception and reality of life in my beloved country, which I've done my best to serve all of my adult life, is that it is, it is absolutely intolerable that in the 21st century democratic Bahamas, where transparency and accountability should by now be the norm and not the exception, that we would be here today debating a bill designed to remove the arbitrary power of a politically appointed attorney general, albeit duly ratified by the Constitution, the supreme law of the land, to step into a court and discontinue or determine a criminal proceedings without explanation. That's completely unacceptable in this day and time in the modern, the modern world in which we find ourselves. A practice that has clearly been abused by both sides of the political divide. We are no exception over here. That's why we bring the bill. A practice, Mr. Speaker, which has reeked of corruption in this country. Political corruption, Mr. Speaker, might be described as follows. The use of powers by government officials for illegitimate private gain. One writer says this, all illegal acts by an office holder constitutes political corruption only if the act is directly related to their official duties, is done under the color of the law, or involves trading and influence. And so, Mr. Speaker, every time an Attorney General in the Bahamas uses his constitutional powers provided by law in accordance with Article 71C, which allows him to discontinue any stage, at any stage, before judgment is delivered, any such criminal proceedings instituted or undertaken by himself or any other person or authority, and, and, and as he can use it under part Four of the Criminal Procedure Code Act, Section 52, which allows him, the Attorney General, to, in any proceedings against any person at any stage thereof, before a verdict or judgment, as the case may be, the, the Attorney General may enter a nolly prosequi, either by stating in court or by informing the court in writing. And so, by, by, by permitting this unfettered Mr. Speaker, we are opening up the office of the Attorney General for claims of, of political corruption. You know, his, his acts may not be those motivated by corruption, but because of the cloak and dagger style of the entering of the Nolly Prosequi in the current dispensation, it will always avail to, to, to comments, to, to, to assertions that, that the Attorney General has done something wrong. We are seeking to remove that assertion and stigma from the office of the Attorney General. Mind you, the charges don't have to be true, as I said, but they will be made nonetheless. And so, Mr. Speaker, bluntly put, the unbridled power of the Attorney General to arbitrarily enter a nolly prosequi avails itself to political corruption of the type that we seek as a government to eradicate from public life in the Bahamas.
You know, I, I, I'm sorry, Mr. Speaker, I, I, I forget I'm not supposed to use that word, corruption. <laughs> because that's rally talk. And the international community might hear us and, and downgrade us and not want us to come and not want to come to our country and invest. Rally talk, they call it. But I want, I want, I want, I want, Mr. Speaker, I want, Mr. Speaker, to give everybody who, who claims that this is rally talk a news flash. People know what goes on in our country. It ain't no secret. This world is one big open, wide open community. Wide open. They, they, they go on the internet and they read, you know. They, go, they see social media just like the rest of us, you know. Yeah. Bahamians know on a daily basis that they are taxed for services that they should ordinarily pay for and not be given an, an, an additional tax. Because if you don't pay that additional tax, everything goes slow. We be we, 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 we trying to correct these things in our country. We are transformative. And you know, I heard Southern Shaw say that he is so proud and pleased to be serving alongside a prime minister who is not afraid, not afraid to, to remove from, from the office of a political appointee the ability to enter a nolly prosecutor and put it firmly in the hands of a, a public servant who should rightly have the ability to conduct the prosecutorial affairs of this country, to remove it from, from, from any, any view of political interference. And I am, I am equally as proud to be serving alongside a prime minister who is a transformative man. Not afraid, not afraid to stand on principle while others stick their hands, and I like to say this, their fingers in the air and wait on the proverbial political wind to blow to figure out what direction they should go in. Come on, man. <laughs> And so this bill seeks to remove the power from the hands of a politically appointed attorney general when it comes to criminal legal proceedings for and against the state. It will help to remove the perception of corruption from the office of the attorney general in this regard and rightly place that authority in the hands of an independent senior public official. Mr. Speaker, it is my view that every effort we make to remove the appearance of corruption from public offices, we build confidence in the systems and institutions that are so vital to good order and good governance, whilst simultaneously diminishing the, wide, the widespread perception, be it true or not, of corruption in our country. And so now, Mr. Speaker, despite being keenly aware of the egregious abuses of power wielded by attorneys general on both sides of the political divide and their indiscriminate use of the nolly prosecui, the side opposite, in their typical disingenuous and hypocritical fashion, has taken the government to task over this bill. Taken us to task. You know, and, and that reminds me, you know, we can't say anything about corruption. But every chance they get, they jump on the UVP. <laughs> the UVP, man, Brent. Sorry, sorry, uh, uh, sorry, sorry, Minister. <laughs> Sinan, so, Sinan. They, they, they. I mean, they. <laughs> United Brent Party. <laughs> I, I, I heard. You know, and and and, and this, you know, and I, I want to remind the side opposite, you know. I want to remind the side opposition, I'm 55 years old. I, I, I want to remind the side opposite, I'm 55 years old. I told my old man many years ago, I don't care nothing but the PLP, but about the, about the UBP. All I care about is what the government is doing to progress the Bahamas. Stop. And so I, I want to all, I want to admonish you all, you know. Stop every opportunity invoking this racism. This this racism that seeks to divide our country. I'm an Abaco boy. Kalani? Yeah, but you 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 often you often holler you often holler when Kalani talks about corruption. 
But you want us to sit silent when you talk about racism. Right. Y'all always talk about racism. Last two weeks ago, the other uh, hometown <laughs> jump out, jump out, and harken back to kill a mockingbird. This I found it amazing. South Andrews roots. But, you know, I remember when I used to play at Chinook, Lani. Every election. Every election. Roots next generation. <laughs> every, elec every election you had to suffer through the series of roots. And it's really hard for a black man to sit down and watch Kunta. <laughs> and watch. <laughs> <laughs> and watch Kunta be whipped for his freedom. Yeah, let me leave that alone. And so the same crew which had the benefit of the Constitutional Commission's report, I mean, after all, they commissioned a review and did nothing to divest their Attorney General of unfettered power, now come here and holler to high heaven that we have, we have not gone far enough. And if that ain't hypocritical. They say that our bill is among the worst in the region, that our bill is only fluff, talk, and rhetoric. They who brought no bill, they brought no bill to mitigate the possibility of, of a politically directed prosecution, as you know, an abandonment of an ongoing prosecution because of political or commercial interest, as opined by my esteemed colleague, the member for Elizabeth, during his contribution to this debate. Well, Mr. Speaker, this bill seeks to stop such abuses in the Bahamas whilst ushering in an unprecedented level of transparency and accountability to the process that has never before been seen in our yet developing country. This bill, Mr. Speaker, is an integral part of our government's effort to mitigate political corruption by removing the ability of a politically appointed Attorney General from arbitrarily Discontinuing, discontinuing a criminal proceedings before justice might otherwise be done. Amen. In the 2013 Constitutional Commission report, it is also instructive on another point. The report points out the following. The position of a political attorney general as the person ultimately responsible for criminal prosecution is an anachronism, a throwback in a democratic system and a contradiction of the separation of powers doctrine. The Constitution's attempt to make the Attorney General not subject to the direction and control of any other person or authority in the performance of its quasi-judicial function is not something likely to engender public confidence in the independence or impartiality of the Attorney General, no matter how scrupulous and well-intentioned any individual holder of that office might be. The point being, Mr. Speaker, is that as it currently stands, when it comes to the performance of his quasi-judicial functions, or in other words, the exercise of his discretion after considering all of the circumstances of any particular case, and he determines to enter a nolly prosecute, the Attorney General is not subjected to anyone, not even the Prime Minister who appoints him. And in the end, the entire cabinet, which invariably shares a collective responsibility, is left open to potential public disdain and political ridicule based on his action. Some of you all over there felt that. You felt that. Then you have an attorney general who could just go rogue. A nolly. Without, without, without any further explanation as to why. Not required. And frankly, no one truly believes that a politically appointed Attorney General acted alone when he exercises, and I use the he in the, in the, in the generic sense, when he exercises this power. <laughs> because after all, the Prime Minister appointed and could disappoint or remove a rogue Attorney General. You know, let me, let me leave that one right there. What, what we seek to do is to break the monopoly on this unfettered power by an attorney general, if you will. That's what we seek to do. And to put it firmly in the hands of a public servant who's empowered to operate outside of the arc 
of political authority in the exercise of his duties. We seek to put power in the hands of the people by placing it in the hands of an independent director of public prosecution. A DPP who will be clothed in the power of his own office to conduct the affairs of the people without fear. Yes. This bill is for the people, Mr. Speaker. Yes. This is for the people because, after all, it is their time. Yes. This bill is about transparency. It's about accountability. As this bill, as in this bill, Mr. Speaker, in our forthcoming amendment to Clause 3 thereof, we will require that specific directions given by the Director of Public Prosecutions, given to the Director of Public Prosecutions by the Attorney General, not only be put in writing, you know, but also be published in the Gazette, in the House of Assembly, at the earliest opportunity. As such, the bill brings a level of transparency and accountability to the prosecutorial process as it relates to the exercise of the nolly prosecute and the discontinuance of a, of a criminal proceeding such as never before, never before been realized in this country. And you say we haven't gone far enough? You say we haven't gone far enough? And so to say that the bill does nothing is simply dishonest, is disingenuous, is duplicitous, is all things wrong and dumb. You know, it's all, especially after saying that, especially after saying that and then getting up and endorsing the bill. Are you, are you, are you going to endorse a bill that does all of these things wrong and does not go far enough? Politicking. Country don't need no more politicking. What we need is progress. We need, we need an opposition party that would push us to do better. I'd come in this place with rhetoric and politicking. We need, we need a powerful opposition. Our system depends upon it. This bill will also somewhat deal with the issue of separation of powers doctrine or the vesting of legislative, of the legislative, executive, and judiciary powers of a government in separate bodies as pertains in most democratic states. It is a minor point to be made but necessary in my view, as our Constitution provides for the distinct functions of the legislature, the executive, and the judicature as arms of government, but also provides that the Attorney General can intervene in the exercise of the judicature's function by entering a nolly prosecute at any stage before the delivery of a judgment. This, in my view, is an issue which this bill seeks to ameliorate by placing the power of the Nolly Prosecutor in the hands of the independent DPP. As it stands currently, Mr. Speaker, with the exception of cases involving consideration of public policy, national security, or the international obligations of the Bahamas, the Attorney General no longer has the unfettered discretion. Remember now, you're no longer leader of opposition business over there. <laughs> I, you know, you know, you know, I, I work, I work long and hard to invoke that anointing that I know comes from that side to push us forward. It took some time, but I'm glad it's back. And so with the exception of these cases, Mr. Speaker, the Attorney General no, no longer has unfettered discretion to simply step in and shut down a criminal proceeding within the remit of a court. Where matters of public policy, national security, or international obligations of the Bahamas arise, the Attorney General must have the right to intervene. And such intervention must be reduced in writing and duly signed by that Attorney General. Where the Attorney General determines to, enter, to issue specific directions to the DPP under considerations of public interest, national security, or international obligations. Such writing will be published in a gazette, and it then becomes discoverable. As such, 
No longer will it be commonplace in this country for an Attorney General to enter a nolly prosecute without offering some form of, of an explanation as to the circumstances surrounding the case at hand. As I wrap up, Mr. Speaker, much ado, much ado has been made about our AG being able to, to issue instructions relating to national security, national interests, and international obligations. Although under our current constitutional structure, the Attorney General is granted complete freedom and immunity and control of prosecutions, he is said to not be subject to the direction and control of any other person or authority in this regard. In reality, he's a member of the executive, and that often leads to the perception, whether rightly or wrongly, that he can never really operate free of political considerations. Many countries have therefore passed le legislation or made constitutional amendments providing for the state's prosecutorial functions to be exercised by an independent DPP with security of tenure. We are no exception in this regard. The Bahamas is following suit in this regard to ensure there is complete independence and transparency in the institution and control of public prosecutions. It should also be appreciated, despite what has been said by detractors, that there is nothing inconsistent about establishing an autonomous an independent DPP and retaining some supervisory role in the Attorney General representing the state to give directives in cases where there are public interest or national security concerns. This model has been adopted by several states. Firstly, as I close, Mr. Speaker, firstly, it should be appreciated that the legislation envis envisages consultation and collaboration between the AG and the DPP on these matters. Well, he brought some, he brought some here last week, you know, week before last with Jamaica. Yeah, man, they, 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 they can still deal with, with interest, Canada. with national Canada. They can still deal. That's why it was so disingenuous. Yeah, but if you look, if you look at the final description of the law, you'll realize that these are the same. These are the same. No, you try to mislead. You try to mislead. Which, which government is going to give a public official Right? The complete authority to deal with matters of, of, of international obligations. Which government? Show me one. Show me one. Public interest and, secu and national security interest. Which one? Which one? Talking about misleading. Secondly, I got two minutes, man. I got two minutes. It must also be appreciated that it is left to the government at the end of the day as the elected representatives of the people to determine what is in the public interest or in the interest of national security. For example, in some contexts, issues such as public health, national security, anti-terrorism, defense, or international obligations will have to be weighed with other considerations in making prosecutorial decisions. Thirdly and finally, and perhaps most importantly, the fact that any directive given by the AG in this regard is required to be gazetted and subject to public scrutiny ensures that there is transparency and accountability and that any supervisory function any supervisory function vested in the attorney general cannot be abused in the end result mr speaker that there is no fetter on the independence of the dpp and the ability of any political interference or abuse on his part it is just that the state reserves as all modern states the right to control these critical areas. And so, Mr. Speaker, North Abaco supports this bill, which will help to move our country progressively forward in openness and sunshine with accountability and with transparency. Mr. Speaker, I thank you. The chair recognizes the honorable member for St. Anne's. Thank you. <clears throat> I just rise to make a few comments. By being the only person who current sitting of this house has ever been attorney general, we've had ministers of state responsible for 
legal department. No disrespect to my... Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but to my knowledge, most of the time, the AG sat in the other place. Matter of fact, when I was AG on two occasions, I was in the other place. Uh, the previous attorney general was in the other place. So it is common to have the uh, attorney general. I, don't, I am speaking, Mr. Speaker, from the heart in this matter because I sat in that chair and had to exercise the functions that the attorney general has to exercise. Fortunately, at my time there, I never had to exercise the power to bring an action against the prime minister. And I'm not too sure the previous attorney general ever thought about it either. But <laughs> although the occasion may have arisen, but that's my opinion. I will start off by telling you a very simple story which is indicative of the holder of that office. I go to work early. There's no secret, everyone knows I go to work early. Um, I'm in my office at, I don't know, seven, six o'clock in the morning. And I had left messages that night with every single phone number I have. My wife's phone number, my wife's cell phone, my number, the office number, et cetera, et cetera. Because that particular day in London, there was a appeal to the Privy Council, well, the day before in London, time, time changed, against the hanging of probably the last person we got closest to the galley, the gallows. The, the officer from the Privy Council called home, of course I left home, and he finally got me at my office to say that the Privy Council had had a stay of execution in the execution of a criminal who was due to be hung at 8 o'clock that morning. So, fortunately, I had to go and phone the prison, and I got the superintendent of, the, of then Her Majesty's prison, and he asked me to put it in writing not to hang Mr. So-and-so. Well, I didn't even, at that stage, the fax machine was in another office that was locked up that I couldn't get access to. <coughs> And I had to tell the superintendent of the commission, you recognize my voice. My secretary doesn't come in until 9 o'clock. If I have to wait for a fax, the man would have been met his untimely death. We were fortunate the superintendent of the prisons didn't execute the man, and the rest is history. That is the power and the duty that res was residing in the holder of the office of attorney general. So it's no small matter. So in that case, I was responsible for a man's ability not to go to the gallows, and I think that was the last time we got even that close in the Bahamas. We talk about knowledge. There's also the question of instituting criminal procedures. So there's many a time in the AG's office, every day, where a file comes up to the Attorney General, Mr. Speaker, for which his permission is needed to institute a procedure. We're talking a lot of this focus has been ending the procedure, but every day I would have to sign off, and I knew a lot of the names. <laughs> Go ahead, sue them, bring the prosecution. And sometimes when you talk about a person's day in court, the attorney general under no, didn't have to justify it, just says, I'm not going to let John Doe have his day in court because the fellow who did, is alleged to have done the crime might have been whatever. So that's another aspect that weighs heavily on your mind. Daily, you would decide whether or not to prosecute someone for an alleged crime. The police would send it up. The director, the senior officer in the, law, in the attorney general's office would, would say recommend it. But the attorney general had that last say. And he wielded it whichever way he wanted to. And let's not doubt that because I can tell you from personal experience. It weighed heavily on your mind every day. There were cases also, for instance, just to use a good, of statutory rape, where the Attorney General was involved as well. Because whether or not to let a case not, or someone wants to withdraw the application because something happened and, and whatever. No, this all came to the Attorney General. So these are issues that the Attorney General would deal with on a daily basis. So I'll tell you what, I'll, by way of a sideline, Mr. Speaker, I acted as Attorney General many times, and never once that I can remember did I ever sign a, a nully when the substantive minister was out of town, because you left that 
to the substantive minister because he or she knew what the case was. Not an acting attorney general would step in and do that. Not on my watch. And I cut. However, I will say that I have executed, or signed rather, I won't say thousands, but numerous nullies. Now, before the press run off and say, I'm the nully minister, <laughs> when I got there, there were a lot of cases, like 10 years ago, before I was appointed, that someone stole a, a candy bar from Super Value. Or someone had a joint, and a tourist had a joint in a nightclub, and that was 15 years ago. Whether that was a nully or whether it was a not, not prosecuting, I signed a boxes of those out of the way. Because I just couldn't see bringing someone back at, who was 18 at the time, who's now 28, 30, for one joint. Bring him back to, from, the, from Canada to the Bahamas to waste time. You know, let's, let's move on. And I hope, I hope the backlog will be dealt with in due course. For instance, Mr. Speaker, I'm told that some 20,000, and the Honorable Member can correct me, 20,000 uh, summonses, warrants out to uh, have people come before the court. We need to find a way that if those crimes are over 10 years, 5, whatever, they, we just dismiss them. Get them out of the system so they don't block up the system waiting for court dates. You know, the other day a friend of mine went to make a report about getting robbed. And they turned out, the policeman said, we should arrest you because you have an outstanding traffic violation. <laughs> you know? Fortunately, he paid his fee, but the computer system hadn't got the fee in the system, so therefore the warrant was still outstanding for his arrest, and it made him difficult to report a crime at his house. So, there are thousands, thousands. So when we talk about the, the right of the AGU, uh, it is a serious post. Those of you, and I'm not trying to put myself up here and someone else, but when you ha hold that post, it weighs on your mind daily whether you go ahead or do not go ahead. One that still rests on my mind today is I nullied a case. The witness, unfortunately, came into contact with the accused. And the evidence got, well, I, I want to use a different, <laughs> I just want to do that. And I had to nully that case. And I came from the AG's office down the hill, appeared before court, and nullied the case. That still weighs on my mind today. It turned out that the accused was subsequently murdered for, by a friend of his. So, you know. But those are the things, and I just want to bring those attention to the Honorable Chamber, to speak to you through the Chamber, that the, the Attorney General has those powers. They really do weigh heavily on you. It causes you very serious concern. I don't want to get into whether a political person at this end or that end were nullied. They were wrong, all of them, in the ones we try and refer to. But we need to find a way, and this is all I want to stand up to do today, was to take that power out of the hand. And you know, politicians don't like giving up power. No, they don't. Never like giving up power. <laughs> to take that hands out of an elected official or an appointed official in the Senate and put them in the hands of a, a duly appointed civil servant so forever and forever after, we take away the possibility, the sniff, or whatever you want to call it, of political intervention into the prosecution or lack of prosecution of any Bahamian in this country today. And for that reason, I support you. As many? The Chair recognizes the Honorable Member for Golden Gates. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise on behalf of the wonderful and good residents of the great constituency of Golden Gate. It is an honor and indeed a privilege to represent them in this Honorable House of Assembly. Mr. Speaker, 
I give thanks to God for enabling me to be in this place once again. I take this opportunity, Mr. Speaker, to express best wishes and a speedy recovery to Mr. Lionel Sands, the Director of Education, who is a resident of Golden Gate. Likewise, Mr. Speaker, I express my best wishes for a speedy recovery to our former Vice Chairman in Golden Gate, Mr. Antoine Pinder. I express my deepest sympathies to the family of Brenda Watson on her passing. She was a longtime resident on Lobster Avenue in Golden Gate 1. She was a soldier for the FNM for many years in Golden Gate's constituency. And I thank her. I thank her family. I also express my heartfelt sympathy, Mr. Speaker, as others have done this morning, to our colleague who was a member of this chamber, Mr. Calvin Johnson, mm -hmm. and who also ran on another occasion. And we thank him for his service. We thank his family. And may his soul rest in peace. On a lighter note, Mr. Speaker, we will be hosting a basketball tournament and family fun days on the 17th and 18th of November 2017 at Golden Gate Straight Park in Golden Gate 2 where the various polling divisions will compete against one another and there will be activities for the children and food and drinks will be on sale. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we're accustomed to having food free. <laughs> um, Mr. Speaker, on behalf of the constituents of Golden Gates, I support the bill for an act to amend the Constitution to provide for the establishment of the Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, two weeks ago, I listened intently and took copious notes to the contribution during the debate on this bill by the Honorable Member for Cat Island, Rumkin, San Salvador, and now leader of the official opposition, congratulations. He made a lot of hay, Mr. Speaker, about the fact that independent, the word independent, is not mentioned in the name of the bill. He strongly suggested, Mr. Speaker, that independent should have been mentioned but he went further, late in his speech, to hail similar acts in Belize, Jamaica, and Canada. He said, and I quote, that we should look to Belize, Jamaica, or Canada, close quote. He suggested that those countries were progressive, contemporary, and modern. Further, the Honorable Member for Cat Island said that, and quote, I quote, prosecutorial independence is the true fundamental point, close quote. Mr. Speaker, if you did not know any better, well, not you personally, Mr. Speaker, but one might have sworn on a stack of Bibles that certainly Belize and Jamaica utilized the phrase independent director of prosecutions, and maybe even Canada. But guess what, Mr. Speaker? Not one of those jurisdiction, jurisdictions actually have the word independent as part of the name of the relevant statute. Mm -hmm. They all say the Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions or something else in the case of Canada. But listening to the member for Cat Island, Rum Kings and Salvador, one would not have believed or imagined that. Mr. Speaker, I wonder if the Honorable Member for Cat Island, Rumkins, and Salvador shared this fundamental point, as he described it, about prosecutorial independence. When? When, Mr. Speaker? His former cabinet colleague, the Honorable Attorney General of the Commonwealth of Bahamas, Alison Maynard Gibson, abused her authority in the Sandals Hotel Workers' Matter. I wonder, did he have the gusto and enthusiasm 
for prosecutorial independence he proclaimed regarding this bill? And if he did, did he share that view with the then Honorable Attorney General and indeed his cabinet colleagues at the time? But I'll return to that, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, not only did he talk about the identification of the bill, not including the word independent, but he also spoke in substance regarding the bill. The, the chair recognizes honorable member for Cat Island, Rumkins and Salvador. Mr. Speaker, I remember again, this member um, expresses a view of what I said that is not correct and is not what I said, nor in, nor in any way what I said could import what he's now saying. Firstly, the word independence was the word being used by all speakers opposite. The word independence is not contained in the bill proposed. It doesn't have to be. I think that the, the, the context in which it's being used as independent by, the, by those opposite is that the effect of what they're doing will create an independent office. And that's what they were saying. I, and and, I, and I, that's what I accepted them to have been saying. This member is saying something different. He's saying that I said it ought to be in the bill. I never said that. What I understood the side opposite to be saying is that they are creating the office, and the office, as he, because of the provisions made, will make that, that office independent. I took issue with that. I said it does not do so. And that's my right to say so. That's their view. My view differs. Then I referred to, I referred to the bills. I referred to Jamaica, Belize, and I also ref I referred to them to say the effect of their creation of the office of the director of public makes it independent. The word independent is not contained in those bills either, but. I refer to specific provisions contained in their bill that I said gives the effect of independence. In respect to Jamaica, I referred to their Article 94.6, which says, in the exercise of the powers conferred upon the DPP, he should exercise them and shall not be subject to direction or control of any personal authority. That's in that's Article 94.6 in Jamaica. That provision does not, does not find itself in the alteration here. In, in Belize, I'm on a point of order. Thank you. I'm on a point of order, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, I'm on Honorable. Point of order, Mr. Speaker. Hon Hon Honorable Member. I'm on a point of order. Oh. Oh. I'm on a point of order, Mr. Oh. Speaker. Uh, yes, yes, Honorable Member for Cat Island. Um, I think you've made the point. Uh, um, the point of clarification basically was that, that the, in the, the word independent does not appear in any of the bills, including the bill before this house. I, 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 the effect and but but you are going further now. No, no, I'm not going any further. The, um, he, he, the, he said, no, Mr. Speaker. He went as far as to say that I draw attention to the statutory provisions or the act or the constitutional provisions of Belize and Jamaica. And he said, and he said the word independence not contained in that. And that is true. And I'm saying I'm now then drawing attention to what is in fact contained so that he will no longer continue allowed to misconstrue what I said. And uh, I'm uh, saying there are provisions uh, in both constitutions uh, honorable that member. speaks to the exclusive that these... Uh, honorable member, forget Ireland. Yeah. Uh, the chair is satisfied that you've made the point. If there's no need to draw attention to what additional uh, provisions might be in those... But, legislation. But Mr. Speaker, if, if what he's saying borders on, not quite apart from misconstruing what I said, and he borders on, on basically misleading, misleading the House, I have a duty to correct it. But uh, this and is I, what I'm saying. And, and that's why I go on, further honorable to member, correct the misleading statement we, we about the, the independence. The Chair is satisfied that you have corrected it. Mr. Speaker, let me say I want to thank the Honorable Member. Because he said just now that there was no need for independent to be indicated. That's what he said. And that is what, I was been, that's what I've been saying. There was no need. He agreed with me, and I'm glad he does. And I thank the honorable member for clarifying that. I thank the honorable member. 
He's a good man. He's a good man. That was precisely the point. He suggested that under this bill, the director of the public prosecutions will not be independent. Now that goes to the substance. Again, Mr. Speaker, guess what? All of those countries, Mr. Speaker, whether Belize, Jamaica, Barbados, or Canada, they all have some exception or reservation. And the honorable member, my colleague, just made that point, and he's quite correct, yeah. for North Abaco. He just said that in favor of the Attorney General. They all have some exception or reservations in favor of the Attorney General, and it makes sense to do that, Mr. Speaker. Hence, the principle is the same as contained in this bill and those of the, all of the countries he mentioned. There might be some question of degree, but they all reserve some area under certain circumstances to the Attorney General. They all do, Mr. Speaker. And, Mr. Speaker, very importantly, this bill as written requires, and the bill says, must be in writing and signed. The Attorney General has to state in writing and sign any specific direction he might give the DPP regarding criminal prosecutions. Mr. Speaker, the importance of this specific direction being in writing cannot, cannot be overstated. It is designed to ensure accountability and transparency, Mr. Speaker, on the part of the Attorney General, because the specific direction will be in writing by the Attorney General, and it will be discoverable. That's right. Discoverable, Mr. Speaker. We also know, as has been said by two of my colleagues this morning, that it will also be gazetted which takes it even further. No, that is noteworthy, Mr. Speaker. The fact that it is discoverable, discoverable, because it means, because it means that if a person brought a case against the Attorney General, the person or counsel representing such a client would be able to obtain a copy of that specific direction given by the Attorney General. And I should add, as my colleague said earlier, he made the point and he's quite, quite right, the holder of the substantive position to the Director of Public Prosecutions. Mr. Speaker, you might not have noticed that the Honorable Member for Cat Islands in Salvador yeah, and Rumkey conveniently did not mention this section in the bill at all. No mention. Not once. But we understand, Mr. Speaker, we understand, because it speaks to our accountability and transparency in government. The requirement that the Attorney General put his specific direction in writing is a check on the Attorney General. Right. He cannot hide behind anything, Mr. Speaker. Right. No, he cannot hide. Whether he goes away or not. <laughs> <laughs> Whether colleague minister is acting for him or not <laughs> he must put the specific direction and writing and sign it himself these are uh, these are all written in the in the he in terms of gender neutral recognition but yes or she as the case may be as my colleagues in the back have just indicated it does not say designate read it it does not say designate it does not say acting. No, it does not. Or in the capacity. It doesn't say that either. It says, quote, and signed by the Attorney General, close quote. That is accountability, Mr. Speaker. And that is transparency. That is what this bill is about. Because it is the people's time. Right. Mr. Speaker, lest we forget. It was just over a year ago, last December, pardon me, last September, when the then honorary, Honorable Attorney General, Alison Maynard Gibson, 
issued a nolly prosecute, commonly referred to as a nolly, in favor of Sandals Hotel. I said I'd return to this, Mr. Speaker. And its senior executives against the interest. Against the interest. Let me say that again. Against the interest of 600 workers of the hotel. That was unimaginable, Mr. Speaker. It was unthinkable and indeed unbelievable. Against the interest of 600 workers. But she did it anyway. What did the then Honorable Prime Minister Perry Christie say about it at the time? Not a word. There was a deafening silence from him on such a critical matter and concern for 600 Bahamian workers and their families. Remember? They like to talk, but you know, got to be able to pay the mortgage and school fee and all that. What about the 600 workers? They appeared not to be concerned. Mr. Speaker, there's little doubt that the action of the then Honorable Attorney General, Alison Maynard Gibson, was an abuse. It was an overreach and an arbitrary exercise of her constitutional authority. Unfettered and answerable to no one. That is exactly what this bill intends to fix. They say it all the time. It's their mantra. Fix it. Fix it. <laughs> well, we are doing just that. We are fixing this one now. This one we fixing now. Because it's the people's time. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And I should add, others are coming. Stay tuned. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, the action described above, taken by the then Honorable Attorney General, and seemingly approved by the then Right Honorable, and still Right Honorable, Prime Minister Perry Christie, speaks to their uncanny ability and pension for looking out for their narrow interests at the expense of 600 hard-working Bahamians trying to earn an honest living in their own country. This is incredible. But they would have the Bahamian people believe, as they often say, that they are for, quote, the small man, small group, close quote, or average Bahamian. But we know that is not so. Mr. Speaker, this is a false narrative. They have sold to the Bahamian people for decades, but little could be further from the truth. If that were so, why did not, why did not then the Honorable Attorney General allow the hotel workers' case to be heard to its conclusion and allow a ruling by the learned magistrate and let the chips fall where they may? Why not let the case take its natural course? Mr. Speaker, Mr. Obi Ferguson, President of the Trade Union Congress, is reported in the Tribune on 22nd September 2016 as saying, quote, the entire trade union was very shocked by the move, and he accused the Christian administration of betraying, deceiving the Bahamas Hotel and Maintenance and Allied Workers Union, along with all workers. Mr. Ferguson further points out that despite the TUC, TUC's BHM WACA affiliate and other trade union engaging in, engaging in talks with the government for more than a month, in a bid to resolve the sandal situation and other matters. Neither the Prime Minister nor Mrs. Gibson disclosed that the Nolly prosecute was being, was, was issued. Close quote. They were in discussion for a month and they were told nothing. They showed up to court and there it was. As they say in the language today, what? <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Speaker. It is truly an incredible statement of facts by Mr. Obi Ferguson as to the circumstances surrounding the issuance of the Nolly in the Sandals Hotel matter. Imagine, as he stated, they were very shocked and seemingly dismayed that while at the table with the PLP government making a presumably good faith effort, presumably a good faith effort on both parts, both parties part to resolve the matter, only to learn in court that the Honorable Attorney General and the PLP government gave direction to the court to dismiss the workers' case. Um, wow. mm -hmm. That is what they did. Wow. Entirely unbeknown Incredible. to the union and the workers. 
But the POP would have the BMP would believe that they were the small man. Mm. They'd always believe that. Imagine. Yeah. They'd always believe that. Yeah. They'd always believe that. Yeah. Or for the average person, or for workers. No point of, yeah. no point of no. It is unthinkable, unimaginable, and unbelievable <laughs> that any government, any government, would treat its workers and people in such a callous fashion. But the Christie and Davis led PLP had a special and canny ability to do just that. The Prime Minister and Deputy Prime Minister that led PLP, yes. Mr. Speaker, when the members of the other side perpetrate that false narrative about being for the small man or average person, I'm often reminded about that fateful day, August 2nd, 2002, when the motor vessels United Star and Sea Hauler collided at sea. It was an August Monday, holiday weekend. Sea Hauler was full of passengers traveling to the Honorable Member's constituency, Cat Island. That day has been described as the worst day in maritime history in the Bahamas. It was truly a sad day, Mr. Speaker, as four persons lost their lives. 25 persons were injured, some seriously losing limbs. What did the PLP government do at the time for the small man? They did just what they did for the 600 workers of the Sandals Hotel. What did they do? Nothing. In August 2003, remember, the PLP was elected in 2002. To May 2007, the PLP was in government and brought no relief in any way to or for the Sea Hall of victims or their families. Nothing. Nothing. For all those years. Mr. Speaker, it was the FNM government that won in 2007 under the Right Honorable Hubert A. Ingram Prime Minister and set up a fund of $1 million to relieve some of the suffering of the victims member, of the tragedy and their families. Honorable Member, the Chair recognizes the Honorable Member for Anderson. Thank you, Speaker. Um, I'm, I'm very impressed that my standing uh, uh, cause for the volume to rise on that end, um, Speaker. <laughs> speaker, the, what is being said is not correct. The member was not around, and I'm probably getting this, this information secondhand. The Ciola incident was an incident involving two mail boats that was and during the interim, it was a legal matter involving litigation and lawyers and the Attorney General's office. But in the interim, point but in doing so he ought not to misrepresent the facts as they were mr. speaker I appreciate the good members point of view but I wonder all that she described with the victims and their families feel they did something mm. Mm. I say no more I say no more mr. speaker I say no more Mr. Speaker, as I said, and uh, I'm not so sure it was heard, so I'll repeat it. It was the FNM government that won the election in 2007 under Right Honorable Hubert A. Ingram, Prime Minister, and set up a fund of $1 million to relieve some of the suffering of the victims of the tragedy and their families. The FNM government, importantly, also made it possible for all costs of medical care or treatment that was administered in response to the tragedy at any government health facility was performed at no cost. 
Mr. Mr. Speaker, that is a government that cares for and has compassion for the small man. Mrs. Mr. Speaker, it was on 4th, September 4, 2001, a mere eight months before the general election of May 2002, when the world-renowned straw market caught fire and burned down. The then FNM government, led by Mr. Ingram in response to the fire, made a makeshift, made makeshift and temporary arrangements for the straw vendors. What did the PLP government do at the time for the small man? They did just what they did for the 600 workers of Sandals Hotel, nothing. The PLP came into office eight months later, Mr. Speaker, and for five years, the straw vendors had to endure the same makeshift and temporary arrangements. The FNM put in place, Mr. Speaker, immediately following the fire in September 2001. The same makeshift accommodations. They had to endure them, Mr. Speaker, for five long years. These are the small people, just the small man, just the average people, right down there in the straw market for five years. The PLP did not rebuild or even start to rebuild the straw market. Didn't even start. They made no effort. They made no effort over five long years. Again, it was the FNM government led by Hubert Ingram that rebuilt the straw market for the vendors. Just as it assisted the victims and families of the Sea Hall tragedy. That's who did it. That's who fixed that. The FNM government did. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, and, and, uh, and, and, this, and, and, and this one is, is a big one. This is a whopper. This is a whopper. No, this is a whopper, Mr. Speaker. It was on, and listen to this date carefully. It was on January 10th, 1967. That ushered in a momentous period in the history of our nation. And they all agree with that, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They all agree. I'm, I'm with them on that. I'm with them on that. <laughs> when the PLP government was elected, it was a momentous moment mm -hmm. with great promise and expectation by the small man. Mm -hmm. And indeed, many others. <laughs> and indeed, many others. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, oh, yeah. Mr. Speaker, <laughs> Mr. Speaker, one of the signal planks of that organization for years before, and certainly in 1967, was minimum wage law. But Mr. Speaker, that party was in government for 25 consecutive years. And what did the PLP do at the time for the small man? They did just what they did for the 600 workers of Sanders Hotel, nothing. Over a 25 year, consecutive year period, did they pass minimum wage law? No. To assist the small man, the struggling person, with no relief? No, they did not. The one sure social and equitable piece of legislation they could and most certainly should have delivered for the small man. No, they did not. Can you imagine, Mr. Speaker, a party with its name being both progressive and liberal did not do the one thing it could to lift the small man and the masses that supported it out of their economic condition and station in life. Instead, Mr. Speaker, the PRP kept wages low, and whatever the market, whatever the market, these are progressive and liberal, whatever the market would or could bear, imagine whatever the market would bear, or what the business interests would pay the workers of this country. And the PLP did nothing for 25 long consecutive years. And worse, Mr. Speaker, that's not the worst of it. Most, if not all, of the countries of the Commonwealth Caribbean had already passed minimum wage. 
legislation on or around the time that we became independent in 1973. Most, most of our Caribbean neighbors had already done that. By 73, 73. They were there from 73 to 92 and never did it. But they for the small man, Mr. Speaker. They would have the Bahamian people believe they for the small man. Must be in their dream. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, again, it was the f and government led by Prime Minister Ingram that passed the first and only minimum wage law yeah. ever to be passed in the Commonwealth Bahamas in 2002. The first and ever in 2002. It was the f and government that stepped up to the plate and delivered for the small man and the workers of this country. Not only, not only in terms of minimum wage, Mr. Speaker, follow this for me for a moment. Follow, I, and I want to bring people to hear this. I want you to know, not only did the FNM government give you minimum wage, not only minimum wage, but it also changed the law from causing you to have to wait 48 hours before you get one hour of overtime. Yes. They changed the work week to 40 hours yes, instead of 48 hours. We, with overtime being made, with overtime being made law after 40 hours or work in a week, Come on, talk on. which most countries had in place for decades. Did you, no, no, I, I want to make sure we be all hear this. Most countries had a 40 hour work week for decades, mm. for decades, but not here in our Bahamas. Mm. Workers had to go to work for 48 hours a week before they got one hour overtime. And it was never changed under the BRB oh, okay, for 25 the years. Oh, but not only that, <laughs> Mr. Speaker, not only that, the same FNM government, Mr. Speaker, protected women. Protected women. What? Anglican, no, I want Anglican head is back. Really. I really need an honorable member for Anglican, the head is back. I, I really need my Anglican. I need the honorable member of Anglican, the head is back, because she, she, she can like this party. Yeah. <laughs> but not only that, the same FNM government protected women from discrimination based on pregnancy. And many women have sought and received the protection or benefit of the law yeah. over the ensuing years. And there's no question about that. Why? There's no question. Why? I myself represented a young lady Make who it. was terminated. You know what the employers did often. The, 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 the person goes on leave, pregnancy leave. When they come back, there's no job when they come back. They have somebody else doing the job, they let them go. Well, I had that same situation. I represented a lady, and, and we got some good money for her as a result <laughs> of the same law. Result of the same law. So I, we, we know these are the facts. These are the facts. Yeah. Women, Bahamian women, are protected today when they're pregnant. That's right. Their jobs are protected That's right. mm -hmm. before, during, and after pregnancy. Before, during, and after. Due to this bill, Who did it? bought by the Free National Movement government. But they for the small man and women, mm. and average women. So they say. So they say. Mm. And, and then I was believe. Mm. Mr. Speaker, <laughs> Mr. Speaker, it has been the FNM that has and continues to champion the causes of the small man. Make no doubt about it. The average person, workers on the whole, and indeed the women of the Bahamas. And I would like to add one final thing at this time about the false narrative, about the POP being for the small man. They often brag, Mr. Speaker, how they passed the Social Security law or made provision for national insurance, post-independence. But Mr. Speaker, while a Social Security system is laudable, <coughs> is laudable, how? could they have put in place such a system that took money from the same small man who already didn't make much, having not passed a minimum wage law? How could they, Mr. Speaker? They did nothing to lift them from where they were economically, but they put the cost of national insurance on them. <laughs> they only made things more difficult for the small man. Mr. Speaker, this Constitutional Amendment Bill, which provides for the establishment of the Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions, will hopefully prevent situations like what I just described 
regarding Nathaniel Poto Maris from ever happening again because the act provides, among other things, that in the case of criminal proceedings, those would be in the name of the director of the public prosecution and in the case of civil proceedings in the name of the attorney general. Hence, the attorney general would be responsible for civil proceedings, but the director of public prosecutions would be responsible in the main, in the main, for criminal proceedings. And yes, Mr. Speaker, there will be very limited cases when the Honorable Attorney General, in matters of public policy, national security, or international obligations of the Bahamas, give general or specific directions to the Director of Public Prosecutions. These would be very limited, few, rare, and infrequent. But equally important though, when they occur, equally important though, when they occur, the Honorable Attorney General, if he gives a specific direction, he will be required required, importantly, to do so in writing and sign it himself, mm -hmm. or herself as the case may be, such instruction. Mr. Speaker, this bill rightly enables the Honorable Attorney General to maintain some involvement in prosecution. But the salient and critical observation here is that it will be in a transparent nature and effect. And that is what the Bahamian people want and desire. And Mr. Speaker, that is precisely what this bill provides. Mr. Speaker, I am convinced that this groundbreaking and monumental piece of legislation by the people's government will serve the nation well for many years to come. Mm -hmm. Mr. Speaker, before I take my seat, I want to remind the Bahamian people that the PLP, to a member, at the time, voted in this Honorable House of Assembly in 2002 in favor of the referendum which included a separate provision that was voted for on for an independent director of public prosecution. To a member, they voted in this Honorable House at the time, Mr. Speaker, for and in favor of the referendum changes, the constitutional changes. And they left this House and campaigned vigorously on the ground against the same provisions. And indeed, every last one Talking about being duplicitous? <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I congratulate the Prime Minister, Dr. Honorable Hubert A. Minnis, Honorable Carl Bethel, Attorney General, Honorable Ellsworth Johnson, and the Cabinet of the Bahamas for a well done job in bringing this visionary and much needed piece of legislation. Mr. Speaker, Golden Gate supports this bill. And may God bless the Commonwealth of the Bahamas. Thank you. Uh, as many. As many, the chair recognizes the honorable member for West Grand Bahama and Bimini. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. I rise on behalf of the great constituents of West Grand Bahama and Bimini. We continue to rise, Mr. Speaker, amidst many blows that are being thrown at the moment. I am here to use my voice to tell our constituents of West Grand Bahama and Bimini that better days are ahead and it began on May 10th when you elected a new government for the Commonwealth of the Bahamas. 
Before I begin, I wish to pay respect and give sympathy to the family of the late Queenie Hannah, a woman whose life exhibited humility, generosity, and love of neighbor to the highest degree. She would have passed just recently, and to her family, our prayers are with you. There is also prayer being sent up for young Kiara Russell, who remains in the intensive care unit of PMH here in New Providence who continues to suffer from leukemia, just recently graduating from high school. Our prayers are with you and your family. We know that you are a fighter. Get well very, very soon. Mr. Speaker, today I am here and I speak after contemplating whether or not I should actually lend my voice to this bill after being given a choice as to whether or not we wanted to discuss it. But I realize that now, a days, any opportunity that you have to raise your voice <coughs> is to be accepted. I am mindful of the fact of the recent Progressive Liberal Party convention where a colleague for Angliston was not able to speak. <laughs> I don't want that happening in this house. So I take full advantage of using this opportunity to raise my voice. I don't um, necessarily subscribe to that. I am to say, however, that she is quite an inspiration, and one day I wish to be just like her. Not bad. So Mr. Sorry, Speaker, they didn't they didn't recognize inheritance that. is a serious thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sometimes things are passed on to us that we wish not to have. And in this instance, many, many problems in the West Grand Bahama and Bimini constituency continue to plague us at the hour, which we continue to address as a government. I wish to say to constituents that we hear your cries, we are aware of your issues, and we are working furiously to make sure that you get the results that you desire. Continuing in our West Grand Bahama and Bimini constituency, for all of our residents who are asking when help is coming relative to what we would have inherited in our house repairs situation, I say to you that help is here. We hear you. We will respond to your need, and we will definitely ensure that your lives are of quality and assisting the best way that we can. You are not forgotten. We hear you, and we will act accordingly. Right now, Mr. Speaker, in our constituency, we continue to respond to measures that were taking place that were not in the best interest of our residents. People continue to be evicted from apartment complexes. Persons continue to not get the help that they so desire because under the previous administration, measures would have been taken place that had no checks and balances. And as a result today, many are suffering as a result of that. Checks and balances are very important, Mr. Speaker. And what we aim to do through the legislative process at this juncture is to ensure that checks and balances are in our system. It is for the betterment of our country. Why is it important to establish the Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions and for matters connected thereto? In our system of governance, Mr. Speaker, in the Commonwealth of the Bahamas, it is vital that we keep the division of responsibilities concerning the branches of government, namely the executive, the legislative, and judiciary separate and distinct from one another. We as a government must uphold the mantra of maintaining the mechanisms of checks and balances, which allow the successful prevention of accumulation of any concentration of power in one area. You know, Mr. Speaker, power or perceived power is a serious thing. When there is an end all with one person, we are just shy of major, major problems occurring consistently. 
Hence, the interest that the fundamental principle establishing an independent office of the DDP is key to upholding this process. Mr. Speaker, when we really look at it, the current office of the Attorney General is basically more or less a government official which gives against his or her independence. This is what we hear on a daily basis from members of the public. Many continue to question how is it that someone appointed by the government is the end all to matters which affect so many in our country. This is not good for the administration of justice, particularly in the eyes of the public who may view that the AG is of the risk of not being fair and impartial. Mr. Speaker, we are here to fix it. Many have said that what we are doing has been started before, but what was started and not completed, completed has nothing to do with us as we will complete what we have begun. Mr. Speaker, residents always ask, how is it that the AG seemingly has the last say? Even in matters when they are looking into cases involving their very own. It is often perceived that there is no fairness. We have to change that. Our system, our governance, our country, and fairness and impartiality is too important to continue along the path of which we are currently on. There has to be an independent, an independent office which lends to our country moving forward positively. This free national movement government is keen on ensuring that this country actually moves forward. You know, Mr. Speaker, it is so interesting that the very same party which prides itself on bringing independence to the Commonwealth of the Bahamas all of a sudden has a problem with the word independence. All of a sudden, it has become a dirty little word. When they brought it, it was good. But now that we're bringing it, there's a problem. Mr. Speaker, the Bahamian people honestly are no longer on the run of politicians who use the fancy words and the jargons to maneuver their way to what it is that they wish to see. The common man is now asking for explanations, fairness, and impartiality in our judiciary. We're on our way to that. You know, Mr. Speaker, the only bills that the former administration would have brought are those that are continuing to cause us some very serious problems in this country, bills that have left us in debt which we will take some time to get out of. But this bill, Mr. Speaker, is the beginning of something great. It was under the Free National Movement government that we freed the airwaves, and we are well on our way to freeing the judiciary. It is important in the fight against crime and ensuring justice in our country. Mr. Speaker, we will begin this process and we will see it through. Foundations are laid on which buildings and infrastructure comes about. This is yet another foundation that will remain strong and ensure that members of the public, citizens of this country, have a say in whether or not they believe that justice was served. We can no longer allow anyone to feel that once they pick up a telephone and make a call to their colleague, that little something is dealt with. It can't happen, Mr. Speaker. It must not happen. We are up here, we are in here to uphold the law, and this is something that this bill is aiming, is aiming to do. There's a lot of misinformation that continues to be spread regarding this bill. Many will have it to believe as if there is actually no independence when it comes to the AG's office 
and the establishment of the DDP. As it states, Mr. Speaker, the Attorney General, and I quote, may in any case involving considerations of public policy, national security, or the international obligations of the Bahamas give general or specific directions to the Director of Public Prosecutions as to exercise the powers conferred upon the Director of Public Prosecution. Also, Mr. Speaker, it indicates that the Director of Public Prosecution shall have power in any case which he considers it desirable to do one of the following, to institute and undertake all of the following, to institute and undertake criminal proceedings against any person before any court. Criminal proceedings, Mr. Speaker. Criminal proceedings. We are taking criminal matters out of the hands of just the AG and relaying it. Criminality in this country, Mr. Speaker, sometimes, unfortunately, is at a very, very high level. And you wonder why the common man does not trust the judiciary or the government or politicians. It is because of the fact that we have not given them anything to believe that they can trust. This bill will give them indication that we are serious about transparency and that we are serious about ensuring that anyone who disobeys the law will be held to the highest standard and justice will be served no matter who they are. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, it's very simple for West Grand Bahama and Bimini. We are desirous of a nation in which every citizen feels as though at the end of the day they are not taken advantage of. We want to know that just as the man in the street and the man at the helm of the country, if they commit a crime and they are found guilty, they will serve their time. We can no longer expect just the law to be held at the ground level, but when it reaches a certain ceiling, it stops. West Grand Bahama and Bimini, Mr. Speaker, lends, it vo lends its voice to this bill. We believe it is needed. We believe the time is now to implement it. We stand 100% behind it. Mr. Speaker, many will have questions as we continue this process, whether or not it's actually going to make a difference whether or not there will be true independence as it relates to this. What we can say, Mr. Speaker, is this. We have started the process. We are not afraid of bringing it to the table. We will get the results that is desired. We are well on our way to freeing not only parts of business that has to be conducted by the AG, but well on our way to freeing the judiciary. There has to be a separation, Mr. Speaker. It is accountability. It is transparency at its best. It is at the highest level that it needs to be. Mr. Speaker, we say today, and we thank those responsible for bringing this to the table. It is something that is long overdue, Mr. Speaker. You have those that begin the process and stop it right in the middle and you have those that bring the process and see it through. We are that group, Mr. Speaker, that will see this through, not just for today, but for the generations to come. It will make a difference, and we're happy, Mr. Speaker, to bring this bill to the table. West Grand Bahama and Bimini supports it. We look forward to the positive results of it. We ask all of our constituents all of our citizens to become educated on it and to also raise their voices to ensure that from this day and moving forward that this bill not only passes but it begins to make the impact that is long needed in this country the law is the law no longer can we have those at the top who believe that because there is some power that they can bypass it it has to stop, Mr. Speaker. This bill is just the beginning of that, and we support it.
Thank you very much and have a good day. As many. The chair recognizes the honorable member for Marco City. The chair recognizes the honorable member for Bamboo Town. Morning, Mr. Speaker. I think this is an ample place for us to uh, suspend until 3 p.m. So I move that the House do now suspend until 3 p.m. 1st of November 2017. Is there a second? Second. Second. It's been moved and seconded that the business of the House suspend until 3 p.m. this afternoon. As many as are in favor will remain seated. Those who oppose will rise. The business of the House stands suspended until 3 p.m. this afternoon. <laughs>